in the future. I, I, I actually copied down uh, when he said, you have a choice between a highway to hell and a stairway to heaven. And that was a great choice. He talked about our, our trip to the New Jerusalem. And do we have a ticket? Do we have a reservation, as it says in Scripture? And I'm thankful that Jesus Christ paid for my reservation on the cross Amen. with His blood. So I want to thank you, too. And so uh, it's just wonderful. A couple of announcements that uh, I want to make of things that are going on. You'll notice opening up in the bulletin, our English as a second language uh, registration and placement is coming. Our Awanas will be restarting in September. And then something new, something, something new is our men's breakfast. And that's going to be next Saturday in the Fellowship Hall from 8.30 to 10. That's our, our men's breakfast. Uh, we're calling our men's ministry Amen. Amen for Arbor Men. Amen. So, Amen. Amen. You got it. Amen. God bless you. And we'll have a, a wonderful time of, of fellowship and, and things. And uh, our ladies have showed us the way with their teas and missions, uh, fellowships, and all that they do. And uh, now it's our turn for a day. So hope to see many men next Saturday morning for uh, uh, the men's breakfast. So we're going to continue to uh, worship. I uh, want to just welcome all of you and those watching online. God bless you and hello out there, wherever you are across America and all around the world. The magic of technology. What a, what a blessing. So let's worship some more. God bless you and hey, I love you and I missed you the last two Sundays. Amen. I, I missed you. So I'm glad to be back. Good to have you back. Amen. Can we go around and greet everyone in the
before I bring my message uh, this morning, I want to recognize one wonderful, special person who will be leading us and moving out of state to Florida. And it's our loss, Juliet. I, she didn't want to be recognized and everything, but in my heart, I just want us to know. And so, Juliet, just please stand. And we want to recognize you. Florida, and I'm grateful she worked the time, the months and months she was here. She worked with our ESL, worked uh, in our Sunday school, and then in our vacation Bible school. So, Juliet, God bless you. Thank you. Breaks my heart, but uh, you'll, you'll be a blessing back in, the, in, in Florida. So, thank you. Let me give you a blessing. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of John, chapter 4, and in your bulletin you'll see a sermon message outline, and hopefully this will help, uh, help you and bring some clarity into what I'm going to be preaching. I'm doing a, a summer-long sermon series called The Words of Christ in High Depth. We all know about high-definition television and you know, you, you look at uh, these screens on, on a football game or a baseball game, and they look real. They, I mean, they sparkle, and then we've gone a long way from the television age when you had old Zenas and Phil Coase that were only black and white, and they look kind of snowy and yucky, and then you, you got color TV that first came out, and, you know, the NBC Peacock with the color, and then a lot of these plasma TVs, and now huge, humongous TVs and, and things that things look for real, almost like you're there at the ball game and you got the best seat in the house. Well, that's high definition. And I want to attempt to bring the words of Jesus Christ with the remaining summer, this is the eighth message on the sermon series of the words of Christ in high depth. And if you have one of those red letter edition lights, you know, the ones that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Revelation, and there's one in the book of Acts, and then one in Corinthians that's recorded, where Jesus is speaking, it's in red. I like, I like those kind of Bibles because I can easily isolate the words of Christ apart from the words of the Gospel writer. So we're going to focus on what Jesus has said, what he's been saying all along, what we need to hear from what Jesus had said, and what's important to remember on the words of Christ in high death is what was said and who said it and why, why it was said. So this morning we're going to look at John chapter 4, verses 34 through 38. I titled this message, The Ministry of Making Contacts. Most of us are here because somebody made a contact for Christ with you, either invited you or told you about VBS or Sunday school or about this church or about another church where you got saved, somebody verbally counted you or made a contact of one sort or shape or another. And I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here or where I met the Lord if it wasn't for Ben and Donna Gillick and a major Gene Hitchcock. Ben and Donna Gillick were our next door neighbors where I grew up in San Jose, California. And they were attending and going to Calvary Baptist Church in Los Gatos, California. Yeah, that's the cats. The, the cats. Los Gatos, California. And we were in a church going family. We didn't go to church. And uh, they invited me to go to their vacation Bible school when I was 11 years old. It was two weeks back then, and my mom said, yeah, let's get them out of the house for the summer for two weeks, <laughs> early morning and late afternoon. And I went, and I just remember seeing the scene and having a good time with arts and crafts, and somewhere uh, they planted a seed, and it all started by an invitation, an invitation and a contact what is called a contact or an impact or telling somebody or inviting somebody. So that was Ben and Donna Gilling next door. And they still liked me in spite of the fact that I would get up on a little thing by the fence next door and throw dirt clots at their two kids. 
up there while they were in the little uh, rubber pool in the backyard back in those days and, and everything. But, but that's okay. Kids are kids, you know. As Santana sang, let the children play. Children will play. Let the children play. And uh, nowadays they grow up so quick with so many adult issues and things and I let the children play. And one thing I really love about Arbor is the children's ministry we have with Owan, our daycare, preschool ministry, our school ministry. Oh man, Arbor kids and the musical and the, the, all the, the dance lessons and the singing and the choreography and they'll be all starting back up again and in September. I praise God for the care and the trust God has given us with children. Many of your children, grandkids, and out in the community. Then Major Gene Hitchcock invited me to come to his church when I was a, a young man. And uh, I said, what's, what's the name of the church? And he said, well, it's uh, New Hope Southern Baptist Church. And I thought to myself, wait a minute, aren't those the crazy people? <laughs> aren't those the whacked out fanatics? Uh, aren't they the weird ones? And I said to Gene, I said, sir, I, I grew up in San Francisco Bay Area. I, I, I had nothing to do with the South, nothing to do with the culture, don't, don't know it. I wouldn't fit in. They wouldn't want me. And he said, sure they would. So he invited me to come to their church service, and I kept blowing it off, putting it off. I always had an excuse every, every weekend. I would, you know, I, I got the duty, sir, I can't, no, I'm going this, I'm going to San Jose, see my mom and dad, and, and this was six months, and I was committed not to go. I understand as a pastor that there are people committed not to go to church. Sometimes they're the members of the church, but we're not going to go there. I'm back on my vacation, so I still want to be on your good list. At least give me a month to get back on the, you know, and things. So I, I was committed not to go, and I kept finding an excuse. But he kept asking me, kept making the contact, kept making the contact. And I think in that church, they were taking the members and they were turning in each week. Now, we're not going to do that here. But each Sunday morning in their Sunday school class, they were turning in a sheet of paper with how many contacts they had made the week before. And he probably counted me and things, and I was a contact. But I was more than a contact. I was somebody who was lost, had no hope, held back, but somebody Jesus Christ died for on the cross. Amen. That's, that's who I was. Amen. But I wanted really nothing to do with it. I thought it was just kind of strange. And my viewpoint was that a real man, a real woman don't need God. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's good for little bitty kids in Sunday school and little old ladies with blue-gray hair. But, you know, a man and a woman, they don't, they don't need God. But he kept being persistent. He wouldn't give up. And there's a lesson there. God never gives up on us. Amen. God never, ever gives up on us. And he never will. We may give up on the pastor. We may give up on the church. We may give up on this and give up on that. But God never gives up on us. And Major Gene Hitchcock kept inviting me. And finally, I came up with a brilliant light, kind of Einstein genius thing. I thought, if I go one time, he'll, <coughs> he'll cook bugging me. If I go one day, quit bugging me. So I finally told him. I said, yeah, I'm going to be there this Sunday. He was in shock. And I said, what's the address again? And what's the time? And he gave it to me. New Hope Southern Baptist Church in Santa Ana. It's now a Buddhist meditation prayer garden. And the building I made my public profession of faith and got baptized in is now a Buddhist meditation center that the church folded and died years later, years after. But... I went to the church, parked my car in the parking lot, and got to the front doors of the church. And I was scared. I was terrified. And I thought I was a tough guy from San Jose, San Francisco. You know, and and I, I, I almost turned back. Almost turned back. Because I didn't know I was going to be inside. Are they going to grab me? Are they going to choke me? Are they going to stick me in a dump tank? What are they going to do? They're going to steal my wallet, steal my money. I, you know, I didn't know. I never been. So finally, I got up the nerve and walked through the front doors of that church and got inside and I looked around and I went, these are pretty normal people. I don't see a weird one among them. 
and they were very gracious, and I sat in the church, the pastor, I, I remember I was 21 years old at the time, the pastor was my age, and I thought to myself, man, uh, I looked around, and I didn't understand a single thing he was saying, I really wasn't paying attention, I was waiting for, for it to end, and get out, and be done, and maybe the Hitchcock will never ask me again, and, and then at the end, you know, they hung around, they had a potluck. They actually had a Baptist pot. I never even heard the word potluck when they said, can you stay for the potluck? I said, potluck? What in the world is that? And uh, that's where uh, all the ladies bring in a corning glass thing. And <laughs> it's got potato macaroni salad. That's your Baptist potluck. And then real greasy fried chicken, you know, Baptist chicken. And things like that <laughs> and everything. And I thought, click, a light went on. The food's probably better than the food in the barracks and the mess hall. I was in the Marine Corps at the time at Saints and Adel Toro. Baptist church back from a year and a month in Vietnam. So I went and the food was good. The people were wonderful. They were gracious. But they all talked weird with these southern accents. And here I'm San Francisco Bay Area. But they were delightful, they were warm, they were wonderful, they accepted me. And one of the uh, men said, hey, uh, would you be willing to play on our church softball team? And I said, this is what I said. I said, yeah, who do I got to kill? They're trying to be cool and tough guy and all this. And st you know, just stupid at 21. Just, just dumb. <laughs> And uh, I said, yeah, I love baseball. Yeah, sure. He says, well, there are only two requirements. And I said, what's that? He says, if you're here two Sundays a month, you can play and start. And we need a second baseman. I said, well, I'm left-handed. I'll play anyway if you want. So I started coming, and I, you know, I could come two, at least two. It got after a while that I listened to what the pastor was actually saying. And something struck home. And I realized that even though I was kind of a good guy, I mean, I wasn't doing drugs, I wasn't doing a lot of bad, bad stuff and all that, I knew something was empty and missing in my life, and it was Jesus Christ. Amen. So I asked somebody, says, why are all the people in the choir so happy and glowing? And the people here so upbeat and happy in this church, all these old people, because to me, back then, people in their 30s were old people. <laughs> back then. Uh, why are they so happy? I said, because they're Christians. And I said, well, wait a minute, I'm a Christian. I live in America. I'm not a Hindu, I'm a Muslim, I'm a Buddhist. I'm a Christian. I live in America. He says, no, no, to be a Christian, you want me to explain it to you? And I said, yeah. So the, the, the layman, the man that invited me to the softball team, pulled out a little booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws, went through it. God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. But all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He asked me if I was a sinner, and I didn't even have to think about it. I said, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. And then he said that Jesus came to die on the cross. Have you ever heard of that? He says, yeah, vaguely. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, duh. And he says, have you ever asked Jesus Christ to come into your life as your Savior? And I said, no, I don't even know what that is. And he showed me there was a prayer. I, I prayed the prayer of asking Christ to come into my life, and the next morning everything was different. Amen. Not only was the next morning different, but my eternity was different. Amen. I started going to that church, and uh, I was there every time, every Sunday, every Sunday night. I was there for prayer service, and I, I loved going to church. And I loved being among God's people. They were so warm and, and wonderful. What I'm saying is this, it all began with contact. Amen. It all began with an invitation. When I was preaching on the Billy Graham crusade team as a preacher in his crusades, I did a lot of study with the, the leaders and things, and they said that uh, people that come to the big stadium where Billy Graham preaches, 90 percent of them come at the invitation of an existing church member. They just don't walk on. Lost people just don't walk onto the stadium. They sometimes are bought in a church bus. That's why Graham would always say, if you came in a bus, 
and you come forward, they'll wait for you. Amen. The mega churches in America, the churches that run 2,000 and over, and we're in the crossfire about uh, in between, in the middle of three or four significant, big, big, big churches. And I've spoken in some of them, and I know, and this is what their pastor and staff tells me, that generally speaking, people do not just walk on, except Easter Sunday, that 80 to 95 percent of the people that come to the church and get saved were brought by an existing member. Amen. So with that background, let's take a look at the ministry of making contacts. Hopefully, uh, this will make sense to you. I'm thankful that Ben and Donna Gill have cared enough to invite an 11-year-old boy, their next-door neighbor, to their vacation Bible school. Because obviously a seed was planted that germinated. I'm thankful that Major Gene Hitchcock was persistent and wouldn't give up on this sergeant who thought he was tough stuff, but was nothing, was nothing. And that Jesus Christ is everything. And so, chapter 4, verse 34 to 35, uh, 38 actually, let me put this in context. Jesus is up north in Samaria and had been sharing and witnessing with a woman who needed Christ. And uh, in, in verses, uh, actually, interestingly, in verses 20 through 24, they had a discussion on worship. I'm not saying it was an argument about worship, but they had two different views of worship. They were debating whether up there in Samaria, that Mount Gerizim was the place where you worship God, or was it Jerusalem? You know, they're worth arguing about the, the place, and Jesus said, it's not the place, it's the heart. And you worship God in spirit and in truth. And it's interesting, in verses 20 and 24, worship is mentioned ten times. Whenever you see words repeated in the Bible in a short passage of Scripture, it has value, it has importance. That's the thrust, that's what it's all about. So there was this discussion about worship, and that ended... And it was time to have a late afternoon lunch. But there was no food. The disciples went about to, to get food. And they brought the food, verse 33, to, to Jesus. Uh, and then we get into verse 34 through 38. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. It's what I live for. To do God's will. Do you live to do God's will, or are you just playing church? Those of you watching on the internet, online, YouTube, and, and Facebook, what do you live for? Do you live to sample sermons of various preachers on the internet? You can, you can see anybody. You can see the greatest preachers in the world, and I know some of our people, before they come and hear me, they, they've heard Charles Stanley, or David Jeremiah, or, or whatnot, on the internet or those channels or, or, or this and that? Are, are you a, a connoisseur of sermonizing and, and preachers and weighing? Or are you doing the will of God? Do you live to do God's will? Notice he says, uh, my food is to do the will of God. My nourishment, food gives nourishment. My will is to do God's will who sent me to accomplish his work. Second, are you doing God's will, and are you involved? Are you partnering in His work? One of the ways Satan hinders us is, uh, you know, we think we have to do everything. So because we think we have to do everything, that we do nothing. Well, we can do something. Amen. We can do something. We can be a Ben and Don McGillick and invite an 11-year-old, you know, persnickety... <laughs> Rogue next door neighbor boy to DBS, which some of you have done. Be a major Gene Hitchcock and specifically invite a young man who's lost to church to hear the gospel preached, and he didn't know. Uh, it was just two, three years ago that I made contact with Ben and Donna Gilly, and they had moved away, and they never knew what happened to me. And I told them, hey, you don't know this, but 
I've become a Baptist pastor, and I'm pastoring the First Southern Baptist Church of Las Vegas, live that way. Now, God bless you guys. Thank you for inviting me to the Vacation Bible School, because that planted a seed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you! Major Gene Hitchcock didn't know what God would do in my life. He saw a 21-year-old young man lost. Hopefully he gets saved. But God saw pastor at Arbor Christian Fellowship in the year 2018. Notice this. God sees more than we see. Amen. God always sees more than we see. And we just see straight ahead. You know, God sees the peripheral and the 360 degree picture. Amen. God sees more than we see. And when we partner with Jesus in this mission of making contacts and doing the work the work of outreach, of evangelism, of mission. We partner with God and we see things as God sees them. Jesus said to them, verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do not, now here he gently corrects them. And wouldn't you agree with me that every once in a while we need some gentle correction? Some, I remember how my dad used to gently correct me when I was... We just grab me by the nap of the neck and shake it a little bit. Then I got the message. <laughs> just correcting me, you know, straighten up, you know, buster. Uh, Jesus says in verse 5, do not say that there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Before I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white already for harvest. Don't say four months from now. Don't say, we're going to get our act together next year. Next year, we're going to be awesome for God. Jesus said, now. If you take the word now and reverse it, it's the word one. Jesus has won the victory for us. And it's not some future thing where Jesus said, don't say that it's for, you know. And then verse 30 said, already the one that reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal. We're in the eternal life business, no matter what you do, whether you're in ministry, whether you're a teacher, a worker, sell insurance, or whether you, know, you work in a marketplace, whether you're an engineer, whether you're in an office, whether you're in a mechanic in a garage, as a believer, and as you partner like Jesus who said, my food is to do the will of him and to accomplish his work, to partner with God. See, Witnessing and sharing the gospel is not some, oh, some burden, no, oh, it's so horrible, oh, I don't want to do it, but we're going to hire a, a gospel Wyatt Earp to shoot down the Clantons on his gospel gun. It is the greatest blessing and privilege and joy to impact other people for Jesus Christ and to make an initial contact. Amen. You may not be the one that leads them to Christ. You may, not, you may not be the one that physically in your car brings them to visit the first time in, in a church, but you can plant an impact, plant a seed, make a contact. And the month of August at Harvard Christian Fellowship is going to be called Count the Contacts. Count the Contact Month. And so we see Jesus uh, says already there's wages, there's fruit. And then it says here that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Now, it's a reality that oftentimes churches have challenges. Churches have struggles. Churches might have some problems. Churches might have some conflicts and personality stuff and, and this and that and whatnot. And I hear misunderstanding or miscommunication or, or whatnot. It happens because we're all human. And there's no such thing as a perfect church. Only Jesus Christ is perfect. Amen. And we don't follow other Christians. We follow Jesus Christ who is perfect. Amen. So if you're church shopping or looking around or whatnot, I, this is not a perfect church because I'm its pastor. And if it was a perfect church, once you join it, it probably no longer be a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect church. But there is a church that seeks to obey God and is on mission and partners with God and, and reaches out and builds children, young people, young adults and seniors and everybody. 
Jesus talked about working and rejoicing together. Then the last two verses, for in this case, the saying is true, one who sows, another reaps. One who sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. We will see people led to Christ that we planted no seed. We will plant seed in the lives of people, and they may never come to this church. They'll go somewhere else and be a blessing, but no matter what, we are working together to build the kingdom of God. Amen. So, with that background in mind, uh, the message is titled, The Ministry of Making Contacts. If you look under, take out your sheet here and follow with me here, it'll make a little more clarity there. You see those three numbers, 120, 100, 110. No, that's not the score of the Astros Dodgers game last <laughs> night. Uh, I think that was the zip. Of course, the Giants got beat too. They, they lost both nights. By the end of the first inning, they were done. But these numbers, 120, 10, and 110 are significant. 120 is, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 120 recorded contacts that Jesus made with people, often in a smaller group, or often one-on-one. One-on-one -on -one. One -on -one contacts, one-on-one. -on -one. Nicodemus. Here, chapter 4, the woman at the well, Matt, Mark, uh, Luke 19, Zacchaeus up a tree. He made, he made 120 contacts recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Amen. Now, what's that number 10? 10, only 10 were in the confines of the synagogue or the temple. So, do the math. Even with the new math, it makes sense. 110 contacts were out in the variety of activities of the day. 110 of those contacts were not in quote-unquote church. It was outside on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. During the regular course of the week, Jesus is, is making contacts. Uh, it's important to have a good front door of the church where people come in. And the Bible says in Psalms, that the Lord loves the gates of the sanctuary. Jesus loves the doors of this church. Amen. Now I grew up listening to the music, the doors, and Light My Fire is a song, and some of their music, you know, never gets old. I know their lead singer has some problems and uh, was lost and needed Jesus. But doors are important. You can't get anywhere without a door. Jesus said to John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any enter in, they shall be saved. They shall find pasture. I am the door, the door of eternal life. There's one door, and that's Jesus Christ. Noah's ark was built to God's specific pattern and instructions, and there was only one door. Amen. And then before the flood came, uh, it says God shut the door. God himself shut the door there in Genesis. But Jesus is the door. Right now, the door is open. The doors of the church are, are open. People are, are welcome. And it's great when a church has a big front door, so to speak. But there are side doors. Ministries during the weekday, not just on Sunday. And one of the things that our first-time visitors don't realize is how much we do during the rest of the week impacting the community. And the side doors... Going, you know, people bringing, coming in through ESL and our daycare ministry, reaching the parents and the families, our, our great children's ministry with Awana. We baptize parents of our kids alive in Awana and they side doors. But God loves the doors of the church for two reasons. Because when you go inside, you can get saved. When you go outside, you can go serve and Make contacts. We see Jesus making contact, and we see how Jesus made contact. Now, something that's curious to me and very fascinating is that right after, in verses 20 through 24 in John chapter 4, all this discussion about worship and the word worship mentioned 10 times, it leads to witness. The context of good worship and real worship leads to our making contacts and engaging with people. 
Building relationships. Building relationships with the unchurched, dechurched, and post-churched. Building relationships. The Gillings built a relationship with their next door neighbor boy. Major Gene Hitchcock built a relationship. Built a relationship with a 21-year-old young man in need of spiritual hope and, and help. We see that these 120 encounters of Jesus, 110 outside the church, so to speak, Jesus built relationships. Christ was very relational. He built long-term relationships. And he was consistent and persistent with people, especially the twelve. The religion that Jesus talks about, the faith and the religion, isn't a, yeah, I'm going to date myself with this, it isn't a brill cream relationship. Guys, remember, brill cream, a little dab will do you? <laughs> of course, you know, the competition was butch wax, and I grew up in the generation where the young high school guys had butch wax and they had true cuts. Of course, I was the first guy in my school to grow my hair long after seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show and actually got kicked out and sent home and thrown out. Uh, but you use the butch wax, the real cream, and you know, it's more than just a little dabble, do you? It's a total, complete life immersion. Jesus wants to be Lord of your life. Amen. He's Lord. The word Lord is mentioned 433 times of Christ's being our Lord. But we see the ministry of making contact. Worship leads to witness here in chapter 4. And so when we worship, we love singing, we love praise. Uh, you know, you get a good worship band and everybody's standing and swaying and things and we're worshiping and some raise their hands, others are in their heart. And you know what? That's not the end. That's the beginning of going out and making contacts and telling people that Jesus loves you. And God has a wonderful plan for your life if you haven't heard it. Here is what it is. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying every one of you have to become soul winners and evangelists and, you know, be talking and talking and talking. I'm going to define what contacts are. And we're going to look at it during this month and how Jesus made contacts. So you'll notice, Jesus, number one, identified people. Notice there in verse 35, he says, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Look and see people. I know when I went to pastor, First Southern Baptist Church in Las Vegas, and if anybody from Las Vegas Church is watching, it probably wasn't you. Because we have so many new members come out. Uh, but at the beginning, everybody was people blind. They were literally people blind. Their focus was on their preferences in church. They wanted certain things a certain way and, and this way and, and, and all that. And, and uh, I, I'd much rather do the Lord's preferences in God's house. What God wants. Amen. Yes, we all have things we like. We all have ways and this and that. And you know what? We can work together for it. And we can let go a little bit for the greater glory of God if it reaches souls. And let's focus on what God is doing and places where God is working in our church. Jesus identified people. He says, lift up your eyes and look. See You'll, you'll see under count of contacts, build relationships, see people, verse 35. Look, see people. See people. That's why I make an extra effort several mornings of the week to go to Starbucks. And I got a group of eight, nine, ten guys I regularly see off and on, sometimes not all of them, sometimes two. I like it when only one's there. Because then I can really share uh, and, you know, look at ask about their heart and, and where they're at. And two of them have come to our church. And so, you know, I hang out. I, you know, my spiritual gift is to get to hanging out. And I don't preach. Uh, I don't thump them over the head with the Bible. I don't say, oh, I don't have my mentee and here's a new guy and sits next to me. He says, hi, I'm Reverend Gaines. 
God did, yeah, you know. No, I mean, uh, that, that comes later. Then it's Christ. And say, wow, you're just like a normal guy. I don't know about that, but uh, you're like a regular guy. And I said, sure, that's what all of us are. There's no holy in the now, you know. I used to be back, you know, churches, it was, you know, holier than now, you know, holier than now. Now it's hipper than now. Okay, in our church, hipper than now. But the Bible talks about us reaching out. So, you know, I, I go to the gym and meet guys, and uh, I do a couple of things. I try to get their names. I don't, at the very beginning, call them on Pastor Danny, you know. Uh, that I, hey, I'm Danny, and, and yeah, I just, you know, lift them the dumbbell alongside of them, and you start conversations. And, and by the way, they're all natural. They're, they're all natural. They're, it's, you know, it's, it's just natural. So three places, and pray for me on, on these places where, you know, I try to be salt and light. Starbucks, Baker Ranch, sometimes the one on Trevico Canyon. I've got constituencies, small groups basically in both places. And a couple of them will ask me, what you preach on last Sunday? And I'll tell them, give them the outline and talk about Jesus. I'll say, since you asked. A couple of times they'll joke and ridicule me. You know, I don't know what they're thinking. They might think I'm a big loser, a big buffoon, and a clown, and this. Uh, sometimes they'll tease me, and hey, that's okay. It's building a relationship. But you know what? When their hearts are broken, guess who they're going to go to? Amen. Because all of them are unchurched. All of them. And the two guys that came aren't going to church anywhere or haven't been. At least they, they came. So one time they, they, they said, hey, Pastor Danny's. Do something religious. So I took off my ball cap and I said, okay, let me take the off from <laughs> And I won't start laughing and everything. Just kind of trying to keep it friendly and uh, keep it laughing. And uh, there's a time and a place that gets serious and you've done the nitty gritty. Like Steve got him alone from Starbucks and started talking and he told me, I do not believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's all a myth. That's all made up. And I said, really? Now, 20 years ago, I would have got, gone into a top attack dogma, you know what I mean? I'd have gone into an attack dogma that I'd say, ah, oh, you're wrong, you're going to burn in hell, and, you know, turn and burn. But, you know, I, that, that's not the way Jesus operated, as we see. That's not the way Jesus operated. All I gently said is, I, I can appreciate that. A lot of people feel that way. Uh, I can understand you feeling that way, but here's what I found. And then I just said, you know, if I'm wrong, I haven't lost anything. And I've had a good life and enjoyed being in the church and loving God's people. But if you're wrong, you've lost everything for eternity. Amen. And, you know, I'm not going to say it made his day, you know, like Dirty Harry, go ahead, made my day. No, but it gave us something to think about. It communicated. It was a, it, it was a genuine dialogue. So Jesus identified people. He said, Zacchaeus, come down from this tree. I, I want to be in your house today. I want to have lunch with you. Yes, I know you're a scoundrel. I know you're a cheat. I know, but I love you. Amen. And Zacchaeus accepted Christ. Zacchaeus was the last man Christ led to the Lord before he went to the cross in Luke 19. And that story ends with these words. The Son of Man was come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.10. So Jesus identified with people. Also, notice, he not only identified people, he identified with people. The woman at the well, they were both thirsty. He said, give me some water. He identified with people. And the greatest of all identification was the Word of God. The eternal Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. The eternal God that spoke the creation into existence spent nine months in the womb of a virgin young girl. Now, in God's wisdom, Jesus could have showed up at 33 years of age the first day and the next day gone to the cross. But Jesus spent years as a teenager. He probably wasn't rebellious. He, probably, he was perfect. But he identified with this. And the greatest identification was that he was baptized by John the Baptizer or John the Baptist to identify with us. 
that we follow the Lord in believers' baptism as we identify back that Jesus identified people, he identified with people, and the next word is an insurance term. If you know anything about insurance and identity, indemnity, indemnity means that you get back what you lost. To identify, indemnify, you give back what was lost. Jesus came to this world to give back what was lost in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve lost the communion and relationship with God. And Jesus Christ came back to give back what was lost. What was lost was life. The soul that sinned shall die, Genesis 3. Through Jesus Christ we have eternal life. Notice it talks about the fruits of eternal life, verse 36 here in this path. The fruits of, he identified people. He gave back to what the devil has taken away. He came, gave back to what we've lost. We're created in the image and likeness of God, but because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, it's been tarnished and we lost what God originally wanted for us. Now through Jesus Christ and the work on the cross and are accepting Him as our Lord and Savior, we get it back. He indemnified people. And then there's that double indemnity. Double indemnity. I think insurance term, that's if you have life insurance and you're killed in an accident or something, the insurance policy that you have doubles the amount of money you get. Perhaps some of you in the insurance industry or if you maybe can clarify that more. In Jesus Christ, we have a double indemnity. We have eternal life forever. Forgiveness of sin. But you know what? We have a life right here that is a life of abundance. A life that is full with meaning and purpose. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, unfortunately, when we talk about abundant life, we always make it monetary. You know, it's money. You know, get rich. If you follow Jesus, you'll be the quarterback. If you follow Jesus in high school and you're a young girl, you'll be the cheerleader, the head cheerleader. If you follow Jesus, uh, actually, through biblical experience, uh, there's a lot of persecution for those who follow Jesus. But he gives us a life of meaning and purpose here, not just eternal life, but in this life, a life of purpose, of fellowship, a wonderful life. But for me, knowing God's people and being blessed by, by you, being blessed by no pastor in America ever had a pastor's appreciation month like I had here last October. And I wasn't even your pastor, I was just your interim. What a what a loving people, what a kind, wonderful, loving people. I can guarantee no pastor in America ever had a special pastor's appreciation money. This church gave me. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be forever grateful. He identified people. He identified with people. I remember in Africa when I was there, I made 14 trips on mission in, in Africa. There's a story about... Uh, a minister, and he wore a cross, and he was visiting a, a leper colony, and he was t talking and reaching people, and, and he bent over to pray with a, a leper, and somehow the chain broke loose, and the actual cross fell in to an open, sore wound. And, you know, the host and the doctor, don't, don't touch it, don't get it. And he went and got, got the cross, and he made the point that Jesus steps in, and the cross falls in to the spiritual pus and brokenness and sickness of our lives, to the grace of God, through God's mercy. Amen. He identified with people, indemnified people. So count the contacts, build relationships. As I close, Psalm 147, 4 says God counts. God counts them. He counts the stars. He counts you. Why? Because you count. Things to do, see people. Verse 35, look, see people, plant. And a, a contact is this. What is a contact? Building relationships for an eternal purpose. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't even have to know a bunch of theology questions. Sometimes it's simple, hi, how are you? And uh, think when the time is right to invite them to a special 
like our music concert in September with Adams Road. That's going to be a fantastic concert here. Uh, or a special thing, the, you know, Children's Night of uh, uh, VBS and, you know, Arbor Kids performances and Easter Sunday. Uh, you'll notice something here. What, what is contact? It's talking and tracking. Now, I, I use three by five cards to write down the names of the guys I meet in the gym or at the guitar center, or I know some of the guys that work there, and, you know, and, and things, and I, I write their names down and, and uh, just have it on a prayer list. And on Wednesday nights during our prayer lectures, haven't we not prayed for these names? Amen. And two of them have come. I mean, two of them ha have come. Uh, it's talking and tracking, and it's best done among existing relationships. See, we think witnessing is going out to some park and seeing total strangers, then bopping them over the head with a Bible, and you all come. We have enough existing relationships to reach hundreds of people. It's a fact that the average person knows about 10 to 15 people in their circle, whether it's a club or, you know, just a in the neighborhood or some social area or service thing or where they work. And you take a church like ours, any attendance anywhere, you know, uh, last Sunday was 66 during August, uh, a good good attendance for August. Uh, uh, we, the, the highest we've had since I've been here after Easter, not, not counting Easter Sunday, is 129, uh, a few in the hundreds. So let's just use 100. That means the people in our church have 1,050, unless my math is wrong, well, over 1,000, over 1,000 prospects and suspects to make contacts with, of existing, existing relationships that are natural during the day, during all the contacts. It's building relationship for eternal purpose, creating some new relationships, casual conversation, strategic invitations. And notice batting 300, you see that batting? If a baseball player for 15 to 20 years bats 300, which means you fail 7 out of 10 times, you strike out, pop up, or, you know, ground out, seven out of, you fail 70% of the time, you bat 300, you're in the Hall of Fame, batting lifetime 300. Of course, not Ty Cobb's 367, and more recently, Tony Gwynn and you know, Wade Boggs in the 330s and Stan the Man Usual. There's a joke about Stan the Man Usual. St. Louis Conquer. The very first game he ever played, he got two hits. After a long, 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 long career, the last game he played in, he got two hits. The snarly sports writer said, no improvement. <laughs> Hall of Fame <laughs> career. You can have a Hall of Fame career inviting people failing seven out of ten times because there's a fact for every ten people you invite, three will come. Eventually, seven will never come. That's, that's a great percentage. But you know what? You're batting zero, zero, zero if you never take a swing. Amen. When I coached Little League for seven, eight, nine years in Northern California, the Chicago Bay Area, I was the coach and manager. I didn't care if my boys and a few of the girls, I didn't mind if they struck out as long as they took a swing. If they called three straight called strike, I benched them. Of course, I'd get grief from their dads, but, you know, I was the coach. And I could decide who struck. I didn't care if they struck out four times in a game, as long as they were swinging. So, talking, tracking. Con casual conversations. Let me close with these applications now. I'm not talking about somebody else. I'm talking about you and me. Beauty of making contact, as you see, is something anyone can do, and it's a simple skill. Not everybody's going to supply tweaks as well as Vic and Lyles. Not everybody's going to know Greek and Hebrew as, as I do, studying all these years and paying all these thousands dollars, uh, you know, in graduate school and this and that. But you know what? You can make contact. You can tell somebody your name and ask their name. And, you know, probably know you're going to see them again, where you're at, and, and things. And 
uh, you say, Pastor Gary, whoa, back up, Amy. Now, look, you don't realize. I, I'm an introvert. I, I'm not a speaker, and I'm quiet, and I'm shy. Wonderful. The introvert can reach other introverts. Just think of it. That's your comfort level. That's your comfort zone. Something anyone can do. It's a simple skill. And number two, you can start tomorrow. So I challenge you in the month of August to make at least one contact and invite one person per week. And then the third thing is we can't do everything, but we can, we can do something. And then things to realize about the harvest that's already right. And it's greater than we think. Matthew 9, 36. Jesus said, great is the harvest, but the workers are few. Let me paraphrase. Great is the harvest, but the contact makers are few. Great is the harvest, but the Ben and Donna Gillies and the Major Hitchcocks are few. Do you know that you can make an eternal impact on a person's life just by saying hi, giving their name, and having a conversation? And you wait for the right time. You know, it, it might not be until the third or fourth or fifth contact or time to Starbucks or somewhere that you say, hey, we're having a, a thing at the church I go to. Uh, hey, I want to invite you to come. Are you doing anything next Sunday? Is that pretty well, you know. You don't have to tell them anything about Calvinism or anything about Arminianism or this ism or that. There are a lot of isms out of the wasms. Just be like Paul. I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Mm -hmm. Let's stand together as our musicians come and lead us for an altar call Him. Here's the invitation and commitment I want you to make this morning. One person this week to make a contact. Maybe even invite them to come to church. Tell them to come and hear that crazy preacher that we got here. We tolerate him. He, he, you might like him, you might not. Give it, give it a try. Or, or come, you got this. Uh, uh, or a special event. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more and more on, on very special events and things. A few concerts and beginning with Adams Road and some other areas and uh, things like that. Some things that cause excitement and stir and something that you'll want to bring and invite people to. If I'm not enough, I can understand that. No problemo. No problemo. But we can have other things to invite people for. So as we're led in this time of invitation, the invitation is twofold. One, just right where you are, make a commitment with God's help, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to say, I'm going to invite somebody. I've got some people I know that I've been wanting to and meaning to, and God, give me the strength and the time to go ahead and, and do it. I've got existing people. And maybe the jackpot, you know, invite them to come, and they, and they, and they come. Or... Maybe you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. Will you make that commitment this morning? Lord, I pray that you come into my heart. Save me. I need you. I'm lost. Similar kind of prayer that, that I pray. Maybe you're looking for a church home. Maybe you are a believer, but you never followed the Lord in the believer's baptism. We'll set up a date and time. We'll talk with you. I'll contact you. You contact me. The email and stuff is there. But as we sing a stanza, let's just commit. Let's just commit the month of August to engage and build relationships. Jesus set the example. I practice it in my own personal life. You know, unless the Holy Spirit forbids me, I might even have a little contest the last couple of Sundays that the number of contacts, I make 30 to 40 contacts per week of unchurched, de church or post church people not going anywhere. That you guys beat and the whole congregation combined have more contacts than me. We, we might do the last couple of Sundays in August. I'm not that big in the contests and that kind of stuff. I don't hand out yellow construction paper bananas and say, be among the bunch next Sunday. I don't do that. <laughs> but you know what? We need a challenge occasionally. <laughs> Man, let's just do something. And uh, be a wonderful thing because God will be using you. Go ahead and sing a new comment. God spoken to your heart. And right where you stand, commit one contact this week. Another thing, when you make contacts, you're
you're like Christ. Don't we all want to be Christ-like? Christ saw people. Look upon the harvest. Look. Lift up your eyes. See people. That's one of the great ways to be Christ-like. So in that spirit, amen? Amen. 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 So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for always being there for us, always providing, always giving us peace, love, but most of all, Lord, your Son. And may we take this and may you set a path for us to follow that we can go out and tell others the joy that's in our heart. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you, and be sure to come back. <laughs>
God bless you all. We we'll look forward to seeing you next week and uh, praise the Lord.